Good morning. It's time for us to get started with our class. We're going to be continuing our study of the book of Romans this morning. We'll be in chapter 5. We just started to discuss the first verse a little bit last week, so we'll just back up and begin uh, at the beginning of chapter 5 this week. So far in this book, we've seen the where Paul defines the universal problem of sin, that it is a he talks about in chapter 1, the, the problem of, of sin with the Gentiles in chapters 2 and 3, problem of sin with the Jews, how everyone is under sin. And then he states in chapter 3 towards the end, the universal solution in Jesus Christ. We maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from works of the law. And he goes on to show that this is how it's always been in chapter 4, using the example of Abraham and using the example of David to show that justification or being counted righteous before God comes on the basis of putting our trust in Him. It comes on the basis of faith in Jesus Christ. And we'll move into chapter 5 this week where we'll talk about, we'll look at the effects of justification and what that does for us. And we'll start looking at, um, as well especially when we get towards the end of chapter 5 and into chapter 6, the necessity of being set apart in our behavior. And so, before we get started, let's uh, bow and begin our class time with a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we love you and we thank you that you've given us this time to be able to study your word, Father. We thank you for the book of Romans. We thank you, Father, for the message that's in it, Father, that it is one that increases our faith in Jesus. And Father, we know as we've, as we've studied over the past several weeks that we can't earn a good standing before you, Father, but we're so thankful to you for Jesus who paid the... Uh, the ultimate price that we can be counted righteous before you. And Father, I pray that we would live by faith in him. Father, this morning, uh, um, I want to ask that you would be with Bob Stump, who's been sick for some time now. I pray, Father, that, that you would help him to, uh, to recover quickly, Father, that, that he would be able to get over the, the pneumonia that he now has and be able to uh, be back with us very soon. And Father, I pray that you go with us through our, through our study this morning. And Father, I pray that it would help us to understand you better and help us to, to come to love you more and trust you more as a result of what we see in your word. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. So Romans chapter 5. It serves as something of a connection between the themes of justification that we've been looking at in chapters 3 and 4 and that of sanctification. In chapters 3 and 4, we saw how justification comes by faith in Jesus. And we saw again and again as we went through that section, how it is not and cannot be earned. We cannot be good enough to earn a good standing before God. Chapter 5, verses 1 through 11, talks about the result of justification. How both sin and, uh, and death and justification by faith are by participation. And this theme carries on into chapter 6 as well. The idea here is that we participate in sin, we earn death. But then by faith in Christ, we participate in His death, burial, and resurrection through obedience to the gospel. And we'll see that in chapter 6, whenever we choose by faith to be united with Jesus in the waters of baptism, we're counted righteous on the basis of that faith. But in each case, it's a decision that we make. Condemnation comes because of a choice to sin. Justification comes based on the choice to put faith in Jesus, which is, manifests itself in, as we'll see in chapter 6, in, at least in one way, it's manifested in our decision to be united with Jesus through baptism. But we're at the beginning of chapter 5 this morning. Beginning in verse 1, it says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we exult in hope of the glory of God. And not only this, but we also exult in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance, and perseverance proven character, and proven character, hope. Hope does not disappoint, because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. For while we were still helpless, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. 
much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Not only this, but we also exult in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. Having been justified by faith, Paul has shown now, he has proven that justification comes by faith. And he says, now having been justified by faith, here's the result of it. We have peace with God. Having been justified, we have peace with God. Up to this point, he's defined the problem. He's stated the solution. He's proven the solution in the Old Testament. Therefore, here's the significance. The cause and effect. Because we're counted righteous, there's no more hostility between us and God. I'm going to look at, and I know we looked at these last week, but because it was right at the end of our, of our lesson last week or right at the end of our time last week, uh, I want to look at these passages again. Having been justified, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. The hostility is removed. Isaiah chapter 59 talks about that hostility. We're going to look at several passages that deal with the separation between us and God on the basis of sin. In Isaiah chapter 59, verses 1 and 2, it says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not so short that it cannot save, nor his ear so dull that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden His face from you so that He does not hear. Sin separates us from God. It drives a wedge between us and Him. We want to be in fellowship with Him. He wants to be in fellowship with us, but whenever we rebel, it drives a wedge in that relationship. And there's a separation. In Micah chapter 3, Verses 1 through 4, we see that same principle coming out. And I said, Hear now, heads of Jacob and rulers of the house of Israel. Is it not for you to know justice? You who hate good and love evil, who tear off their skin from them and their flesh from their bones, who eat the flesh of my people, strip off their skin from them and break their bones and chop them up as for the pot, as for meat and a kettle. Then they will cry out to the Lord, but he will not answer them. Instead, he will hide his face from them at that time because they have practiced evil deeds. And so here he's speaking to the, the rulers of, uh, of God's people and they're mistreating the people that, that they rule over. They're mistreating the nation. And he says, and then you're going to cry out to me? God says, I'm not going to listen to that. There's a separation because of their unrighteous behavior. That's what sin does. It drives a wedge between us and God. And the Israelites traveled around. They carried the tabernacle with them. Moses was given all the instructions as far as how to build it. Here's, the, you know, here's how you put this together. And there was the holy place, the most holy place. And there was that veil. And then later that veil was in the temple as well. And what that signified or what that represented was the fact that you know, in the most holy place was the presence of God. Nobody could go in except the high priest once a year, but that was when he was carrying blood on the Day of Atonement to make atonement for sin. Nobody could go in. Nobody could go into the presence of God. And that's what that veil signified. It was there. It represented the sin separation between God and His people. Then you go to Matthew chapter 27, and you see the significance of what Jesus did when He hung there on the cross. In Matthew 27, 50 and 51, Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up His Spirit, and behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The sin debt was paid. Sin was removed. There is now a way into the presence of God through Jesus Christ. Paul wrote in Colossians that Jesus made peace through the blood of His cross. He took what we had earned, the wages of sin. We'll see uh, in the next chapter of Romans, chapter 6 and verse 23. He took what we had earned. He gives us peace with God 
He gives us a righteous standing. By faith in Him, we get what He earned by His perfect life. As Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5.21, He made Him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. Having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And it's through Him that we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand and we exult in the hope of the glory of God. We obtain our introduction into grace by faith. The idea is that Jesus brings us into the presence of God. This idea of an introduction introduces us into the blessing of God's unmerited favor. Or as Paul would say to the Ephesian church, it's by grace you've been saved through faith. It's by faith that we obtain grace. It's by faith that we stand in it. And being covered by the grace of God is a continual state in Jesus Christ. He, we have we, uh, obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand. It's a continual state. You know, we talked about in, in 1 John chapter 1 and verse 7, if we walk in the light as He Himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another in the blood of Jesus His Son, cleanses us from all sin, a continued cleansing, a continued standing in God's grace. As long as we are striving to live by faith, or as John says, walk in the light, we have a continued standing in grace. Uh, Denny? I'm looking at uh, justified by faith, and, and one of the definitions I have for that is to be pronounced free from guilt or blame. And only God can do that. Man can't justify me by freeing me from guilt or blame. Only God can do that. And he does that because we have placed our faith in him. That's when the grace comes in. We have to have the faith before we have the grace. And we have to get over the guilt that we have realizing our own sin because he's taken that away. Yes, that's right. We get grace because we put our faith in him. It's God's unmerited favor that's on the basis of putting our trust in Jesus Christ. But we receive that grace on the basis of our faith in Jesus Christ. He mentions there it is this grace in which we stand. We're made to stand by Jesus Christ. In Colossians chapter 1, verses 21 and 22, we get another picture of, of this standing that we have before God. We're standing in the grace of God by faith. In Colossians 1, 21 and 22, he says, Although you were formerly alienated and hostile in mind, engaged in evil deeds, yet he has now reconciled you in his fleshly body through death in order to present you before him holy and blameless and beyond reproach. This standing in God's grace means that you stand before God holy. You stand before God blameless as though you've never sinned beyond reproach. We have an accuser we read in Revelation chapter 12. Satan, the enemy. And his charges won't stick as we stand in God's grace, as we live by faith, or as the Apostle John writes in 1 John 1, as we walk in the light. The charges won't stick. In Jude, verses 24 and 25, we read as well about this idea of our standing before God. At the very end of this short letter, Jude says, Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy, to the only God our Savior through Jesus Christ our Lord be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. He's able to make us stand in God's presence as blameless. Well, it's not because we don't have sin, but because on the basis of faith, having been united with Jesus because of that faith, that sin's been removed. And we stand before God as if we've never sinned. And you know, we talked about the definition of justification. It's being counted righteous on the basis of faith or having our faith credited as righteousness. An easy way to remember that, that we're justified, just as if I'd never sinned. We put our faith in Jesus to the point that we're united with Him, that we live for Him. All the sin is removed and it continues to be removed as we walk in the light. 
It's through Him, through Jesus, Romans 5 and verse 2, that we've obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand. We're introduced into this grace and we stand in God's grace because we live by faith in Jesus. And we exult in hope of the glory of God. We exult, or some versions there would say we boast in the hope of the glory of God. The hope that we have of being with God. Hope that comes from knowing that we have peace with God. A lasting peace that we stand in. That we remain in. Now this idea of biblical hope. And I know we mention this quite often. It is important that we get our minds around it. What biblical hope is. That it's not wishful thinking. But it is a confident expectation. It means that we have confidence in our future. We have confidence in our citizenship in heaven, uh, as Paul says to the Philippians. We have confidence in our inheritance that is there in heaven, waiting for us. We rejoice over a confident assurance of our standing before God that we will be glorified with Jesus when He returns. Now when we look here, he talks about we exult in our, uh, or excuse me, in which we stand and we exult in the hope of the glory of God. The Greek there uses the term that would also that would be translated or could also be translated as boast. We boast in the hope of the glory of God. Now we've already seen in you know in chapter three he talks about we're we're justified by faith. Well, where then is boasting? It's excluded. But he's talking about boasting in self. We can boast in Jesus Christ. We can boast in our God. We can boast in how good He is, but we've got nothing to boast about as far as our own performance. You see, all I've earned is condemnation, separation from God. But there's a lot to boast about in Jesus and what He's done. The Jews boasted in the law. They boasted in circumcision. We see that in in chapter 2 as we talked about the sin of the Jews. Paul says that we boast in the hope that comes through Jesus. If we're going to boast in anything, it's in Him, and it's in what He's done. You know, one author writes that the Christian hope is not simply a trembling, hesitant hope that perhaps the promise of God may be true. It's the confident expectation that it cannot be anything else than true. That's the idea of biblical hope. The Hebrew writer says that hope is an anchor for the soul, sure and steadfast. We exult, we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Denny? I'm thinking of the life of a Christian versus a non-Christian because everyone is going to have tribulation in their life. Every person in some time in your life you are going to have tribulation. So you have the hope that God will bring you through that and everything will be okay because he's in control. If you're not a Christian, your hope is based on Nothing, a desperation. That leads to despondency and all kinds of other things. When you talk about hope, you mentioned there the, the difference between the Christian and the non-Christian. The one who has faith in Jesus has a great hope. But outside of Christ, there's not much to look forward to after this life. Paul said, let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 31. And then he goes on from there, he says, not only this, but we can also exalt or boast in our tribulations. Because tribulation brings about growth. He talks about, you know, it seems a little bit weird, we're going to boast in things being difficult. Well, it's not about the difficulty of it in and of itself, but it's about the growth and the result that comes from the difficulty. We can boast, we can exalt, we can rejoice because of the result of difficult times in our faith. He talks about the benefit that comes as a result of the struggles and the suffering we face. Now in the context, he could be dealing with um, the persecution that comes from unbelievers. It could also be dealing with the hardships that everyone faces, the tests of faith that we we deal with. In Matthew chapter 5, verses 11 and 12, Jesus says, Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. 
Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Those who bear up under persecution for the sake of Christ will be rewarded. Those who maintain their faith in the face of difficulty will be rewarded. And he talks about here the progression of it. Tribulation brings about perseverance. And perseverance deals with the ability to keep going and remaining constant no matter what happens. But that doesn't just come about by itself. It comes about by testing. It comes about by tribulation, by the pressures that are put on us. Perseverance brings about proven character. And the idea here is of one who has stood the test. They're proven based on their having remained faithful in hard times. You know that they'll be faithful because they've proven it. they faced hard times and their faith is intact. And proven character brings about hope. All of this helps to convince more surely of God's promises. Chapter 5, verses 2 through 4 here begins and ends with hope. It helps us with tribulation when it comes along to be able to stand firm. Standing firm builds our character, which in turn gives us hope in the Lord. As we stand firm, it helps us to grow. It helps us to be more solid in our character and more solid in our faith in God and our assurance of what we have to look forward to. And he mentions here that hope doesn't disappoint. Hope is a confident expectation. Because of the love of God that's been poured out on us, because we have the Spirit, and we'll see later in the book of Romans, the Spirit testifies that we're His. Testifies that we're His children. Having His Spirit is a proof of the love that He has for us. And we'll talk about, particularly when we get to chapter 8, we'll deal more uh, in depth about looking at what the person who has the Spirit lives like, what that looks like. The Spirit is given, Paul says, to the Ephesian church as the guarantee or the down payment of our inheritance in heaven. Picking up in verse 6, it says, While we were still helpless at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. One will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates His own love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, having now been justified by His blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through Him. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. And not only this, but we also exult in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. He died for us while we were helpless, it says, weak, without strength. We had a terminal case of sinfulness with no hope of being able to do anything about it ourselves. And Christ took care of the problem. We see the extent of God's love in this, that Christ died for us, not while we were trying our best, not while we were, well, just kind of just short of living up to what He wanted. Christ died for us, it says, while we were ungodly, while we were deserving of God's wrath. Chapter 1 and verse 18, he's talking about the sin of the Gentiles. He said, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of the truth, uh, and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth. Christ died for us while we were deserving of God's wrath. Which gets back to the, what it says over in chapter 3 and verse 25, that He was displayed as a propitiation in His blood through faith. That God's wrath at sin, at my sin and your sin, was satisfied when Jesus paid the price. We had earned God's wrath as those who were ungodly. And Jesus paid for it. All the people that are described in chapter 1, Chapter 2 and chapter 3. Those people who had earned God's wrath, who are deserving of death, who have chosen not to acknowledge God. That's who Jesus died for. The ungodly. And he says it's, you know, it's hard to find somebody who will die for a righteous person, maybe even for a good person. But God demonstrates His love toward us in that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. It's so hard to find somebody to die for a good or righteous person. 
Who would die for the unrighteous, ungodly sinner? And this is to emphasize the extent of God's love. God doesn't just say that He loves us. It's demonstrated in Jesus Christ. It is proven. 1 John chapter 3, verse 16 says, We know love by this, that He laid down His life for us. The one act of, in all of history that defines what true love really is and what true love really looks like is when Jesus went to the cross. And He contrasts the extent of man's love. You know, maybe somebody would die for a good man. But God sent Jesus to die for His enemies, to die for the ungodly, to die for those who were helpless. Christ didn't die because we deserve it or because we were such great people or we've done so many good things. He died because He loves us. And it demonstrates His goodness. He died for us because we need it. Titus chapter 3 verses 4 and 5 tells us that we're saved because of God's kindness. Jesus dying is a demonstration of the kindness and the mercy and the goodness of our God. And our justification by His blood saves us from the penalty of sin, God's wrath. He's our propitiation, we mentioned. God's wrath is satisfied by the payment of Christ's blood. He gives us what we don't deserve, justification, a righteous standing, and withholds what we do deserve, wrath and condemnation. We're reconciled, he says there in verse 10, while we were God's enemies. Refers to someone who's in the opposing camp. This isn't somebody who's on friendly terms. This isn't somebody that's in a good relationship. This is somebody who is is talking about people who were at war with one another. While we were enemies, Christ died for us. If God has done so much for His enemies, He uses the lesser to greater argument here. If while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son, much more having been reconciled shall we be saved by His life. If God has done so much for His enemies, how much more will He do for those who are at peace with Him? Think about that when you think about what Paul says to the Ephesians in chapter 1, that we have every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. God has done so much for His enemies. He says, how much more as those who have been reconciled will will we be saved? And not only this, but we also exalt in God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom we have now received the reconciliation. Now we rejoice or we boast through God uh, or in God through Christ because of what He's done for us. Because what we've received. We've received a righteous standing before God. We've received forgiveness of sins. We've received peace with God. We have the Holy Spirit dwelling within us as a guarantee of our inheritance who testifies that we're His children. We've received a standing as part of the family of God, adopted into His family, and we'll see more of that when we get to chapter 8. And we have received hope, a confident expectation of spending eternity with the Lord. We can boast in God through what He's given us in Jesus Christ. Reconciliation. Sin brings about separation. It brings the wrath of God. It brings condemnation. Paul says we maintain that a man is justified by faith in Jesus Christ apart from works of the law. It really just highlights the goodness, the kindness, the mercy of God and what He's done. In verses 12 and following, we see something of the sufficiency of Christ's sacrifice to cover all sin. Picking up in verse 12, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin was not imputed when there's no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam until Moses, even over those who had not sinned, in the likeness of the offense of Adam, who is a type of him who is to come. Sin and death entered the world, it says, through one man, Adam. Adam. 
He brought it into the world, but it's a universal problem. Notice specifically, he says in verse 12, because all sin. That's a key phrase in this section. Because all sin. He brought it into the world, but the problem is universal because you and I have chosen to participate in it too. Sin is a problem for me because I've sinned and for you because you've sinned. Physical death entered the world because of Adam's sin. It spread to all men. Man was driven out of the garden and lost access to the tree of life, but more significantly, eternal life, spiritual life is lost through sin because all have sinned. Let's look over in Ezekiel chapter 18. I want to look at something, an important principle there that goes along with that phrase I mentioned, because all sin. That's a key phrase there in this, in this passage. In the book of Ezekiel chapter 18, beginning in verse 1, he says, Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, What do you mean by using this proverb concerning the land of Israel? Saying, The fathers eat sour grapes, but the children's teeth are set on edge. As I live, declares the Lord, you are surely not going to use this proverb in Israel anymore. Behold, all souls are mine. The soul of the Father as well as the soul of the Son is mine. The soul who sins will die. And then verses 19 and 20 in that same chapter. He says, Yet you say, but why should the Son not bear the punishment for the Father's iniquity? When the Son has practiced justice and righteousness and has observed all my statutes and done them, he shall surely live. The person who sins will die. The son will not bear the punishment for the father's iniquity, nor will the father bear the punishment for the son's iniquity. The righteousness of the righteous will be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked will be upon himself. And so that's a concept there to keep in mind there. It goes along with what we mentioned there in verse 12 of our text. Sin spread because all sin. We're responsible for our own actions. I'm not going to be punished or held accountable for someone else's sin, nor will they be held accountable for mine. The 2 Corinthians 5.10 says that we'll all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. We'll answer for ourselves. Now Paul has already established, and we've seen this in the, the first couple of chapters of the book, that everyone had some standard... Of, um, that all are under sin, chapter 3 and verse 9, you know, as he mentions there in verse 13, sin is not imputed when there's no law. But he's already accused everybody. He's already shown that everybody had some standard. Everybody knows who God is based on His creation, based on His revelation, talking about Jews or Gentiles. All knew of God, whether through creation or His revealed Word. All are under sin. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam until Moses. Even over, even over those who had not sinned in the likeness of the offense of Adam, who was a type of him who was to come. Adam's sin was unique in that it introduced sin into the world. He dis, uh, and he also disobeyed a direct command from God. But what's unique about the sin of Adam is that his sin had worldwide consequences. And that's where we see the comparison there where he's going to talk about Adam and Christ. That Adam's one act of disobedience had consequences for all of mankind. And Jesus' one act of obedience has consequences for all of mankind. And there's a uniqueness in the, um, in the, the sin that Adam committed, even if sin spread because all sinned, even if we're not going to be held accountable for what Adam has done. There is a uniqueness to what he's done in that it introduced it into the world. The free gift is not like the transgression, verse 15. For if by the transgression of the one many died, much more did the grace of God and the gift of the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abound to the many. The gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned. For on the one hand, the judgment arose from the one transgression resulting in condemnation. But on the other hand, the free gift arose from many transgressions resulting in justification. For if by the transgression of the one, death reigned through the one, much more those who receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. Adam introduced sin into the world. 
And he says here, the free gift is not like the transgression. The idea of a free gift, the Lord's no, under no obligation to undo what Adam had done. But it was his own choice, a demonstration of his love. Adam introduced sin into the world. As a result, many died. Adam introduced sin, but everyone has participated in it. Many died because of what Adam introduced. And the grace of God through Jesus Christ, though the argument that Paul is making here is that it outdoes sin. What Christ has done is more than sufficient to undo sin, to undo what was introduced through Adam. One sin condemns, but grace covers many. One sin was enough for physical death for everyone who ever lived. There's a huge impact, but Jesus' one act on the cross undoes and covers many sins. Grace results in our justification, which we get through faith in Christ. No long, death no longer reigns through sin, but grace and righteousness reign in life. So then, verse 18, as through one transgression there resulted condemnation to all men, even so, through one act of righteousness, there resulted justification of life to all men. For as through one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. Even so, through the obedience of one, the many will be made righteous. The law came in so that the transgression would increase, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So that as sin reigned in death, even so grace would reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. One act of disobedience brought death through introducing sin, which earns death because we've all participated. Death spread, it says, because all sin. But one act of obedience brings justification to the many because of participation in the gospel through faith. And that's what we're going to see at the beginning of chapter 6 as Paul continues this argument. We participate in sin to earn death, but when we believe, when we put faith in Jesus, we're united with Him and we're counted righteous. He says the law came so that sin would increase. The law shows man's need. We've seen that already. The law can only bring the knowledge of sin. It shows our need. It shows how terrible sin is. It highlights how sinful we are. And Paul says there, but where sin abounded, and if you were to translate this really literally, where sin abounded, grace superabounded. He uses words, he kind of makes up his own words there to emphasize the point. That what so terrible about sin, grace more than can undo. Where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So that as sin reigned in death, even so grace would reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And what we'll see and what follows this is Paul's going to begin to answer the next objection that would come up. Well, if we're sin, where you have more sin, you have more grace that covers it. And Well, all the way through this book, grace is a good thing. We're talking about the, how wonderful grace is. Well, if more sin means more grace, shouldn't we just keep on sinning more? And that's what we're going to pick up with at the beginning of chapter 6 next week. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? Absolutely not. Because freedom from sin doesn't just mean freedom from its consequences. It means freedom from being enslaved to it. Not living in it any longer. Denny? There can never be more sin than there is grace. No matter how deep sin is, there's always more grace. The grace of God is more than sufficient to cover every sin. But where Paul is going to go next in talking about how we're to be set apart in our lifestyle, that isn't a license to sin. We see that's one of the problems that the false teachers that uh, Jude was writing about. They turned grace into a license to sin. And that's exactly the objection that Paul is answering to here. Well, if grace is so good and we get more grace when we sin more, well, shouldn't we just keep on sinning? And he's going to put an end to that argument and show that being in Christ means we are transformed in our lifestyle. And it means we are to, uh, we're to quit sinning. We're not to continue to live in it. But we'll pick up there in chapter 6 next week. We're just about out of time, so let's...
finish our class up this morning with a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, again, we love you and we thank you that you have given us your word. Father, we thank you, most of all, we thank you for Jesus. We thank you, Father, that although we're sinners, that he's paid the price, that although we've earned your wrath, we've earned condemnation, Father, that we stand in your grace. And Father, we thank you that, that through Jesus we have a righteous standing before you, not because we deserve it, but because of the free gift you've given to us. And Father, I pray as a result we would come to love you and to trust in you more. And Father, to follow in the example of Jesus and that it would, if any of us have not been united with him, that it would motivate us to, to do what's necessary to be united with Jesus. Father, we thank you for him and it's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen.